So hi, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. Um, we're very happy to be here today and to be um, sharing our learnings about VR trainings. We've been working together on VR training since uh, early 2016. And um, today we will share uh, insights from our journey from uh, prototype to rollout. And we will highlight the challenges beyond prototyping. Short introduction about ourselves. So my name is Andrea Radukan. Um, I'm a product manager at Interactive. Sorry. Um, Interactive is a small company. I mean, we're 30 people based in Munich and um, developing solutions um, for AR and uh, with AR and VR. And okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Mirko. I'm working for Audi. I do not start introducing Audi to you. I think it's quite common. So my role is project manager for VR and AR projects in the logistics, and I'm responsible for the coordination of all these activities in the brand logistics. Um, in 2016, I was still working as a program manager for SAP projects. And when we were looking on methods on how to improve rollouts, especially the training of the workers in the logistics, uh, we came over to find a new improved version with VR. And that's when I started to make me VR my main focus. So let's have a look uh, what we um, prepared for you today. So at the first point, we just want to give you an insight on our use case and our prototype. Uh, the second part is we want to share some challenges we discovered when we were doing the rollout, especially um, the difficult challenges which occur in every big organization, and then come to a short general conclusion what our learnings have been there. So if you look at the picture here on the left, you're seeing a typical training center in our plants. This one is the training center in Ingolstadt. It's the size about 1,000 square meters. And you see here, they are all real boxes, real shelves, real vehicles, which we use to create a most realistic environment for the people to train on their job. So for sure, um, <clears throat> um, what is our concern about that? So um, space is very cost intensive and rare in our plants. So for this kind of training, we need a lot of space and that's rare and cost intensive. And to keep all these assets, the boxes, the shelves, the parts maintained, it's also time consuming for the trainers and expensive. So most important for us uh, to look for a new solution was that we had no IT systems for training. So if we are training workers, we go there, teach them the process, then we go to a classroom and show them some slides on how to work with mobile devices and IT systems. And so we didn't have a real success control if the people really understood what we tried to teach them. And yeah, so we rely mostly on an additional training on the job to ensure everybody knows what he has to do. Then Audi came to us and uh, the request was quite clear. We want to have a VR trading prototype um, that shows that learning in VR works, um, that shows that we can teach processes and IT systems simultaneously, and not for just anyone, but for a very specific target group. And this target group was um, factory workers. Um, but our challenge was that uh, there was no concept out there so there was no model in the market on how you teach people in um, VR. So we had to come up with the concept. Um, then we thought about, okay, so how do people learn? We then took a t an approach um, that it consists of two stages. Um, we said, let us um, guide the people. Um, so first we offer them a tutorial where they receive step-by-step -step instructions. Um, they receive visual hints. They receive uh, instant feedback for whatever they do, uh, whether it's positive, so positive reinforcements, or whether it's um, they make mistakes, they always know how to correct that. On the other hand, um, we also want to offer them the possibility to repeat because that's how we learn, by repeating. And we offer them a second stage, which is the uh, training mode, um, where uh, we took a little bit more of a gamified approach, no more instructions, but um, instead some points as rewards. Again, um, on one hand side to 
motivate them to offer a fun element, but still give them a hint that they're doing well or they're not, uh, they're making a mistake and so on, and then help them correct that. So how do we know that um, this training works? Um, we implemented basically um, at the end of each trial of this training mode, um, we implemented a scoreboard. So the people could see their score at the end and compare it to a maximum possible um, amount. And if they were not satisfied, they can always um, repeat and break their own record. So this is again, a motivation to learn. Um, and on one uh, another side, it gives us, any <clears throat> sorry, it gives us an insight um, how do they progress? Like we see the points at the beginning and we see the points after two, three trials. Um, another way is that we implemented some special situations, like sometimes we place broken parts into the process to see if the user is paying attention or we um, um, check the orientation, whether they place really the parts correctly or not. So this is one way that we technically support then the learning object objective. On another hand, um, we, when we think about learning, we figure that there are different ways of learning or people learning different ways. Um, some learn by, from hearing uh, better, some um, learn by reading or visualizing things and some others learn by doing that um, thing on their own. So what we did then is blending all the three to make sure that we cover all the learner types. Um, on the other hand, so this is like the concept part, um, we had to take care technically that the, the UX is also um, easy and intuitive because we don't want people to focus on which buttons to press, but they have to focus on the process. And um, we created a concept there as well. Um, we tested it together with target audience and um, it was successful. Now I would like to, uh, we would like to show you a video so you have an understanding of our work. Willkommen im Trainingsmodus. Sie haben jetzt die Möglichkeit, die erlernten Schritte ohne Anweisung durchzuführen. Sie bekommen für alle richtigen Aktionen Punkte und sehen diese zum Abschluss auf dem Scoreboard. Sie können das Training wiederholen, um Ihren Punktbestand zu verbessern. Jetzt packen wir den. Und jetzt geht's los. Label auf den Karton und die Bremsscheibe mittig unten. Das ist die Bremsscheiben. Well, so much for a little insight in our project. Now we come to the second topic, the worldwide rollout. So when we happened to finish this prototype, uh, sure, for we had loved to go further, implement new controllers, a Manus VR, a Leap Motion, or try implementing new features or new content. Um, but the mission from our management was quite clear. Um, 
this prototype had a state where it should be rolled out to all the plants. So Audi has five plant locations worldwide, which uh, is quite international. We have one plant in Hungary, in Brussels, in Mexico. And if you look even further, um, you really have the chance um, to roll out um, these applications to the whole Volkswagen group. That's about 50 training center because the basic processes in the Volkswagen group are quite the same. Um, <clears throat> so um, if you're regarding um, to roll out to 50 plants, um, there's the problem. You develop this kind of software in Ingolstadt, but you don't not really have uh, users around the world who are familiar with the <coughs> VR topic. So you do not only have to provide a software, you have to provide a complete concept on how to use these training simulations in a real training center environment. Um, <laughs> so uh, furthermore, um, the users need support in a life cycle to support for their software and hardware. And sure, over time, there will come changes in process which need a life cycle management and a changing in the software. So what were the main concerns here in our organization? Um, if you're doing a prototype or a pilot, um, you always have a certain kind of freedom in our organization. So you can try out, implement some things, try it out, um, show it to the audience. But if it comes to a rollout, we are going to productive with such a solution. It's important that you fulfill all the regulations in our organization. Maybe, uh, for instance, the safety at work. So you will have to look at all the risks that can occur with using VR software. And you have to take, um, uh, you take measures to prevent all these risks. You have to make a good work with your together, working together with your health department because you don't know, uh, know many about using HMD in long-term studies. So you have to find a kind of regulation um, about how long can you use all these things in a working environment. So last but not least, um, finally, you have to convince the workers' council <laughs> about the concept. So you have to convince them that this concept really brings benefits and it's a kind of a safe training for the workers and which fulfills a kind of a mission in our company. So rollout and support. Um, basically, uh, you have to provide a kind of standard hardware. Sure, you can go to the media market and buy equipment. But in the organizations, you have to find a kind of a standardized hardware, which is suitable um, to use in the training centers. Um, technically, there are also a few challenges uh, for the software producers, meaning. So we've learned that we have to support um, multiple languages. Uh, so this adds up in general to the efforts of con creating content for um, VR. We've learned that there are process variations of a training uh, in different factories, so we um, need to support that. Um, and everything is just additional to the basic um, cost structure that uh, content creation involves. And this is um, quite intensive, it shouldn't uh, be neglected. Um, why is that? Why is the content creation so expensive? When you think about the VR training and what you just saw, basically, there are different layers. You have this environment that you need to replicate, and for this you need um, objects, pictures, and assets. You need to create this. But that's not enough. You have to give the object some intelligence. They have to react to the actions uh, that the user does. So um, again, additional logic. On another hand, the user has to be able to interact with this object. So again, um, you have to connect the UX and the controllers with all these different objects. And um, all this has to be in a specific order that follows a, a process. So make sure you program it accordingly. Um, and in the end, what the software needs to understand um, is where is the user at every step? What feedback should I, as a software, give? Um, in terms of uh, voiceovers or in terms of uh, visual highlights, um, mistake assistance and so on. Um, so all this requires a lot of effort. It's a lot of logic to consider, a lot of detail. And everything that is cost uh, intensive is not scalable. So for a rollout, you need um, to scale. That's why we uh, came with an answer here as well. So <laughs> <laughs> too much. Um, 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think it's important um, that you have a uniform look and feel if you are in your applications, because if you imagine you have a training center and they are using five different software variations for five different processes, um, you should um, every menu should look the same, the controller handling should be the same, and the user experience should be the same. So how can we achieve this? So we were thinking about um, going into creating a kind of a SDK where we have the chance to put our best practices from the prototype in a kind of software modules which are reusable and then we can then it makes um, then we have the main features in a way ensured that they always look the same. Um. We've also seen that there's a lot of asset management um, involved in the process. So another feature of the SDK would be then to um, ensure convenient or efficient asset management. Um, and we would do this by connecting to different data, data systems and uh, basically pulling the right information um, or the right content at the right time in the right scene. Um, and on another hand, um, we would like to empower then the developers to, or the customers, not, not the developers, but the customers, um, to um, update, make updates of content on runtime. Uh, meaning if there's a change in the process or a new label or and so on, uh, it would be so much effort if the customer would always come to us, tell us, please change this. Um, and then we would have to compile again and we would have to test again. And testing is also very um, time demanding. So um, our plan is to also um, make it possible on runtime to do this kind of updates. And when we think about next steps, once you have your uh, content ready, um, you have to think about how do you deploy it across your organization, because especially in, in international cases, uh, you definitely need a platform. And um, here, Interactive is also thinking with um, the needs of our customers, and we've. Uh, we are offering a platform um, that facilitates this deployment and that is also connecting to um, IT, existing IT structures. So for the last point, we now come to our final conclusions. So um, the first thing is it's proven successful for us um, to validate the prototype. So we put a lot of investments in a very good, very, um, very, very good prototype and then we validate it with user studies to make sure that further investments will have their benefit. Um, on the technical side, uh, while we've seen that going agile for prototyping, prototyping works, um, we think that um, in order to scale, we need to plan strategically um, the next steps, meaning we need to understand uh, well the requirements and we need to plan the architecture uh, of the software uh, well in advance um, in order to support these uh, different requirements. And on another hand, um, when, you, um, when you consider rolling out uh, or scaling this, this kind of solution, you have to think of, on one hand side of K, cost or content creation, um, but also about life cycle and um, deployment because you want your content to stay relevant, to stay up to date um, and to reach the people. <coughs> That's so I think we are a little bit over time. So just a short uh, thank you for your patience. And if you're interested in further topics, uh, you could have a look at Jan's speech, which was yesterday, who is uh, talking about challenges in the uh, big scale industry environment. Or you can have a look at the interactive booth here at the AWE. It's number 112. Thank you very much. Thank you.